The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let us now in silent prayer ask for God's blessing on this worship service. Beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the operations of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take our Psalter in hand this morning and sing number 134. 134. Based on Psalm 48, within thy temple, Lord, in that most holy place, we on thy loving kindness dwell the wonders of thy grace. Let's sing the three stanzas, 134.
Let us now worship God by paying careful attention to the reading of his law, as his law is recorded for us in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that ye may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day to sanctify it, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thine ox, nor thine ass, nor any of thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, and that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, neither shalt thou commit adultery, Neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou bear false witness against thy neighbor, neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's house, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's wife, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. The summary of the law is given to us by Moses in the following chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 6, where Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Let us now respond to the reading of God's holy law by singing. Let's sing Psalter number 354. 354. Three hundred fifty four entitled Our Sure Defense. Let's sing the six stanzas of three hundred fifty four.
Let us now bow our heads and unite our hearts and our minds together in prayer unto God. Our Father and our God in heaven, Thou who dost give Thy grace and Thy peace unto us, Thy people, Thou who hast chosen us to be Thy sons and Thy daughters, Thou who hast appointed us unto everlasting salvation through Jesus Christ, Thou who art the Alpha and the Omega, one who has no beginning of days and no ending of days, who is and who was, and who forever shall remain the Almighty. We come before Thee in the morning hour of this day, for we are thankful that Thou hast called us into this Thy holy tabernacle. Thou art the God who is sovereign over the rising of the sun in the eastern sky. Thou art the God who did send thine angels to watch over us throughout the night gone by while we slept. Thou art the one who does neither slumber nor sleep. Thou art the God of constant and unceasing activity. Thou art the God who by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm didst deliver Israel out of Egypt and take them through the Red Sea, and thou didst drown the ensuing Pharaoh and his hosts. Thou art the God who didst provide for thy people in the wilderness, giving unto them water from the rock and manna and quail from on high. Thou art the one who throughout all history has continued to govern all things, working all things for the good, of thy people, averting all evil, or turning it to our profit. Thou art the God who didst love us first, and we, Father, love thee through Jesus Christ, thy Son. We love thee, for thou art good unto us in providing us with our every need. Thou hast given unto us homes and families, food and great abundance and clothing. Thou art the one who didst give unto us strength in this morning to rise up from our beds and to gather in this thy house of prayer. Thou art the God as well who hast revealed thy goodness unto us and giving unto us so many spiritual blessings. Thou hast given unto us thy word, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, a discerner of the thoughts and intents of man's heart. Thou hast given unto us thy word, which teaches us the way in which we are to go, a word which guides our footsteps down that straight and narrow path that leads life everlasting. But we confess, Father, that we do not always love Thy Word as we ought. At times we can take Thy Word for granted. We can become so caught up in the busyness of the responsibilities of this earth, the cares and concerns of this world, We confess to our shame that we neglect to open and to read and to meditate upon Thy Word with the fervency with which we ought. Father, we plead of Thee, wilt Thou be gracious unto us? Wilt Thou not deal with us according to our sins? But wilt Thou in Thy mercy take our sins and remove them far, far away from us. As far as the east is removed from the west, so far wilt thou remove our transgressions from us. Thou grant unto us the Spirit of the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. May thy love be spread abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given unto us. And may we be given to know 
that thou hast dealt with us according to thy loving kindness. Thou hast forgiven us our sins. And thou hast given unto us, Father, the blessedness of fellowship with thee. Wilt thou, Father, bless this congregation? We thank thee for her. We thank thee for her place in this community. We thank thee for the many different members which are found here in Calvary Protestant Reformed Church. Wilt thou uphold the office bearers whom thou hast called and appointed to carry out the work on behalf of thy church here below. Wilt thou be with the deacons? We thank thee for these men and for their willingness to serve. We thank thee for, Father, the grace and loving kindness that they show. Wilt thou grant unto them good stewardship as they collect and distribute the alms of mercy. We thank thee for the elders called by thee to govern thy church, to be as watchmen on Zion's walls, to protect, to defend, to admonish those who are walking in sin, to comfort those who are cast down. Would thou give unto the elders of this congregation the grace, the courage, the steadfastness by thy Holy Spirit that they need day by day to carry out the work which thou hast called them unto. We thank thee as well, Father, for providing this congregation with a pastor, a man who can go in and out among us, a man who opens up thy word, who rightly divides thy word of truth, who seeks to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and then who brings unto us the fruit of thy word, so that we might eat as a congregation and drink and be nourished in our souls. Wilt thou grant unto our pastor the portion of thy spirit that he depends upon to carry out his work. Wilt thou uphold him and his wife and his family, grant unto them their every need. We think as well, Father, of the members of this congregation who grieve, those who in this week gone by have laid to rest a loved one. Wilt thou, Father, grant unto them the knowledge that Thou art the God who is sovereign, not only over life, but also over death. Precious in Thy sight is the death of Thy saints. Father, as we are reminded again of the frailty of human life, we are taught that our time on this earth is so very brief. Seventy, perhaps by reason of strength, eighty years, thou art generally pleased to give us upon this earth. And then our days fly away, and even as the grass withers under the heat of the noonday sun, so, Father, the breath of our lives is taken from us, and our bodies return to the dust from whence we came. So wilt thou teach us to number our days and apply our hearts unto the ways of wisdom. May we live as those who are pilgrims and strangers here below. We seek a heavenly city. We seek a city which is established by Jesus Christ on the foundation of his righteousness. We seek a city of which thou art the builder and the maker. We seek that heavenly tabernacle made without hands, a place wherein there is no sin, a place wherein there is no sorrow, no sicknesses, no diseases, and no pain. 
Father, we look forward to that day when Thou wilt take every one of Thy, the members of Thy church from off this earth, and Thou wilt bring us into that celestial city that will give unto us the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ. And Thou wilt give unto us that perfect peace that passes all understanding. But Father, as we await the return of Jesus Christ, wilt Thou grant unto us patience and steadfast endurance on this earth. Wilt Thou be with the sick and the afflicted, those who have had surgery or who face yet surgery to come. Wilt Thou grant unto them healing, grant unto them their full recovery, if it be Thy will. And wilt Thou strengthen their faith that they might lean on Thee. Wilt Thou, Father, use the preaching of Thy Word in this worship service for the building up of the members of this congregation. May Thy words minister grace unto the hearers. Wilt Thou be on the right and on the left hand of him who brings Thy Word in this morning. May he be given conviction of truth. May he be granted humility of spirit a love for Thee and for Thy sheep, that He might bring Thy Word in such a way that it can be used to nourish and edify. Wilt Thou keep every distraction far from us as we give of our gifts unto the causes of Thy kingdom. May we give cheerfully, for Thou dost love the cheerful giver. Wilt Thou forgive, Father, even the sins we have committed in this prayer? Wilt Thou guide, guard, and direct us? For Jesus' sake, amen. There are two collections this morning. The first collection is for the cause of the general fund, and the second is for the cause of benevolence.
Let's sing now Psalter number 246. 246. Tell the pilgrims' prayers. Let's sing the three stanzas of 246. Let us turn in God's Word this morning to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. The text for the sermon will be the last two verses of Ephesians 4. We'll read those verses first, and then we'll go back and read the chapter. Ephesians 4, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you go back now to the beginning of Ephesians 4 and read this chapter. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, 
What is it but that He also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that He might fill all things. And He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that need it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Thus far we read God's holy and inspired words. May God bless the reading of the Holy Scriptures unto your hearts. Beloved congregation in the Lord Jesus Christ, the account of Cain and Abel demonstrates unto us what is the significance of the command that God gives to us in this text. The Word of God is put away, but all bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. And Cain never learned that. Cain saw that his brother offered a sacrifice that was pleasing and acceptable unto God. Cain became envious of the fact that his brother was accepted of God. Cain meditated upon the fact that his brother had something that he did not have. Cain 
dwelt on that fact, Cain allowed bitterness to settle in his heart and in his soul. And then Cain took matters into his own hands and blood was shed because there was unaddressed, unrepented of bitterness in his heart. The Apostle Paul gives this instruction about putting away bitterness and wrath and malice in the context of his instruction about the Christian's conversion. There's two aspects here according to the Apostle's instruction that belong to the conversion. There's the putting off of the old man and then there is the putting on of the new man in Jesus Christ. After the Apostle gives that instruction about putting off and putting on, he lists out for us a number of examples of what we are to put off and what we must put on. Put off lying. Verse 25, wherefore putting away lying. We are to put off stealing. Verse 28, let him that stole steal no more. But then as well, there's the positive side of that which we are to put on. Put off lying, but then positively, what is the command? Verse 25, speak. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Put off stealing, but then positively, what is the command? Work. Let every man work with his hands. The Apostle then concludes this section of put off and put on with the content of the sermon this morning, for the sermon this morning. Verses 31 and 32. Here's something that first we must put off that we'll consider in the first point. All bitterness and wrath and anger. But then instead of that, positively, verse 32, be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Kind and tender-hearted. We use that as a theme for the sermon this morning. First, we'll look at the prohibition given in verse 31. Second, the requirement as it's given to us in verse 32. And then third, we'll consider the standard that is set for us, looking especially at the end of verse 32, those words, even as, even as, God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. The text gives a number of things that are prohibited for the Christian. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. All of these, bitterness and wrath and anger, belong to violations of the sixth commandment. The sixth law that God gave to Israel through Moses on Mount Sinai is the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Bitterness and wrath and sinful anger are forms of killing the neighbor. The Heidelberg Catechism teaches us that in Lord's Day 40, which treats this sixth commandment. Quote, that neither in thoughts, nor words, nor gestures, much less in deeds, I dishonor, hate, wound, or kill my neighbor. And then the next question, the Catechism follows up on that by asking this, but this commandment seems only to speak of murder. And the answer of the Catechism, in forbidding murder, God teaches that He abhors the causes thereof, such as envy, hatred, anger, and desire of revenge. Bitterness. What is it? Bitterness is a sinful response in the heart to the unpleasant, undesirable conditions where one is found. 
Bitterness oftentimes is the sinful response of the heart that is directed unto the neighbor. There's been something that has happened in one's relationship with the neighbor that leads to one responding by harboring bitterness inside the heart. Bitterness is not typically something that happens immediately, overnight. Bitterness usually is not the response to one action that the neighbor does which hurts the individual. But oftentimes, bitterness is the response to many, many hurtful words or actions of the neighbor against this individual. Bitterness can happen when contracts are broken. When two business partners come together and they have their agreements, they have their commitments of what they're going to do, and then one or the other breaks that contract, there can be bitterness that settles in the heart of that individual. Bitterness can happen when expectations are not met. Sometimes those expectations can be communicated to the other, and then those expectations are not met. But other times, bitterness can even settle in our hearts when there are perceived expectations, and those perceived expectations are not met. When we assumed that our spouse was going to do this or that, and perhaps never communicated that the spouse was expected to do this or that. And then the spouse does not do what we assumed would happen, and then we become bitter. But it's not only the case that bitterness happens in the relationship that we have with the earthly neighbor. There's another form of bitterness that can settle in the hearts even of God's children. And that's bitterness that is directed against Jehovah God. Bitterness that rises up in one's heart because of the unpleasant circumstances of one's life. Bitterness because one has a difficult and lonely lot in life. And day after day, the individual must bear up under that particular burden. Perhaps a disease for which there is no cure. Perhaps perhaps pain for which there is no relief. Perhaps loneliness, and it feels as though there is no comfort. And day after day, that individual wakes up and faces that difficult burden in his or her life, and eventually, over the passing of time, that individual becomes bitter against God. Perhaps the individual can relate unto Lot, or Job, rather, who lost his wife, or rather, who lost his children, who lost his welfare, who lost his livelihood, and then his wife came and tempted him to curse God and die. The bitter individual is tempted to do precisely that. Bitterness. You understand... Beloved, that bitterness and wrath and malice are destructive sins. We mustn't imagine that I can harbor bitterness in my heart and I might feel justified in harboring this bitterness in my heart because of what was done to me. And it's okay for me to harbor this bitterness in my heart because after all, I'm not going to act out on this bitterness. It's, it's something that okay, I have to deal with, but it's not going to impact my relationship with the neighbor. 
No, the Word of God teaches us what bitterness leads to. It leads to sinful words which are spoken. Verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. Bitterness leads to clamoring and evil speaking. Clamoring is the violent outburst of the enraged individual. He's tried to keep it pent up inside of himself for day after day, for week after week, but at last he can take it no more and he blows up at the individual who is the object of his frustration. Evil speaking is to have slanderous and abusive words which are intended to destroy. Instead of seeking to defend the honor and good reputation of the neighbor, the one who has evil words, searches for the evil in the neighbor, meditates on that evil in the neighbor, and then is so bold as to proclaim unto others, this is the evil that the neighbor has done unto me. Bitterness and wrath and anger is destructive. It destroys church relationships. It destroys family relationships. It can turn children against their parents and parents against their children. But even before bitterness has an impact on the relationship with the neighbor, there already is destructive power in bitterness. Who does bitterness destroy before it hurts the neighbor? You and me. It hurts ourselves. One person put it this way, to have bitterness in your heart is like drinking poison and expecting that the neighbor will die. Bitterness eats away at one's heart. Bitterness pre prevents an individual from having peace in his heart. The bitter individual can become very anxious. The bitter individual finds it difficult to sleep at night. The bitter individual has his mind running over and over again about the hurt that was done unto him. And then he seeks a plan of revenge. Bitterness. It's self-pity wherein one turns to the devil for comfort. God says, put it away. Put away. All bitterness and wrath and anger. How so? How do we put this away? It's not so easy to do. The Apostle Paul has been talking about putting off on the one hand and putting on on the other hand. And the literal meaning of these words, put off and put on, means to take one's clothing off, take off your soiled clothing, and put on clean clothing. But it's far easier to change one's clothing than it is to put off bitterness and wrath and anger and put on kindness and a tender heart. The starting point for putting off all bitterness and wrath and anger must be this, beloved. It must be an acknowledgement that this is my struggle and my battle. The starting point for putting off bitterness and wrath and anger is not looking at the neighbor, not thinking about the person next to you in the pew who may have hurt you, and thinking if only this person next to me would put off bitterness and wrath and anger, then there could be reconciliation and peace in this relationship. But the starting point is acknowledging this is my struggle 
I am prone by nature to have bitterness and wrath and anger in my heart. This is the confession that we make as a church in Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 2. I am prone by nature to hate God and the neighbor. This requires humility of heart to be able to acknowledge that this is my struggle. This is not the struggle out there. This is not merely the struggle that the world has or that other members of the church have. But this is my struggle as someone who has been bought with the shed blood of Jesus Christ but who must still fight against that old man of sin all the days of my life. I must acknowledge that I have to fight against that temptation toward bitterness. And then acknowledging that this is a struggle in one's life. Then one must take the next step in putting off, putting away this bitterness. And in order to do that, I believe it will be helpful for us to examine a little bit how it is that one arrives at that point of bitterness. We noted that you don't normally become bitter overnight, but it takes a while to get to that point of bitterness. Well, what is it that led to becoming bitter? Normally, there must be two things that are found for one to become bitter. First, there has to be hurt. Usually it's a repeated hurt. The neighbor has sinned against me. The neighbor has slandered me. He's tried to destroy my reputation. Perhaps he's stolen from me. He's not treated me with honor, respect, or dignity. That's the first element that is necessary for there to be bitterness. There has to be some form of hurt. But then the second element that's necessary for there to be bitterness is this. There has to be in oneself the thought, I am honorable. I am worthy. I have some value. I have some dignity in my life. When those two elements are found, it usually results in bitterness. So if we are to put away then bitterness, which of these two can we do anything about? The reality is there's very little, if anything, we can do about that first reality. I've been hurt. Living in the context of a community living in the context of a church, of a family, living in the context of gathering with other people who also are sinners means inevitably there will be times that we are hurt. And the Word of God does not call us here to simply overlook that fact. I'm not not saying here that you have to have such thick skin that you never get hurt by others. But we acknowledge that there's very little that we can do to control the words and the actions of other people as they are directed against us. If we cannot control then the words of the neighbor to us, then that leaves the other factor in our lives that leads to bitterness, it's the assumption, I'm important. I am honorable. I am worthy of respect. And perhaps without even realizing it, that's the assumption that we have when we become hurt by others. We assume, I deserve to be treated in a better way And now because this individual did not treat me in the way that I deserve to be dealt, now I have the right to harbor this grudge, this hurt feeling against the neighbor. But are we worthy of that measure of respect? 
Does the ant have the right to say unto the foot that unwittingly steps on it, you had no right to treat me in that way? Have we forgotten about the fact that we are dust creatures and sinful besides who will return unto the dust from whence we came? Putting away bitterness requires that we understand and confess with the Apostle, I am less than the least. And anything that I have is given to me by the grace of God. I don't deserve it. But God in His goodness and in His grace has given these good gifts unto me. So who am I then to complain when I am not treated the way that I want to be dealt with? Put away, the writer says, But then positively the command is to be kind and tender hearted. Verse thirty two and be ye kind and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Kindness, it's goodness that is found within one's heart, which goodness is imparted to that individual by the Holy Spirit. Kindness is moral uprightness and integrity. Kindness is the disposition of benevolence towards one another. The standard for kindness is found in God Himself. God is kind. Luke 6, verse 35, But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be called children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. And then tender hearted. To be tender hearted is to have a heart of compassion that is revealed unto the neighbor in your fellowship and in your conversations with that neighbor. To be tender-hearted is very similar, closely related unto kindness. Kindness emphasizes the goodness, the moral uprightness of the heart. Whereas to be tender-hearted emphasizes the empathy that is to be shown unto the neighbor. Tender-heartedness is revealed in understanding what is the struggles and the difficulties in the lives of the neighbor. The calling here that God gives to us is to be kind and tender-hearted. But sometimes we can object to this. And especially, this can be a struggle for those who are men. For we we can associate kindness and being tender-hearted with feminine qualities. Who's kind, who's tender-hearted? We think of a mother who holds the infant in her arms and who soothes the infant as the child cries. Who's kind, who's tender-hearted? It's the elderly saint in the church, who shows compassion and love unto others. And then those who are masculine might want to distance themselves a little bit from this idea of being kind and tender-hearted. For it might be perceived as a threat to our masculinity. We might imagine that to be kind and to be tender-hearted means that we can no longer take a stand on particular matters. That to be kind and tender-hearted means we have to lose what makes us distinct as an individual and simply go along with whatever it is that other people would want us to do. Let us understand here, beloved, as the Word of God calls us 
to be kind and tender-hearted. This is not a command that is limited to women, but this is a command that goes forth just as much so unto men. It is not weakness to be kind and to be tender-hearted unto others. It does not mean that one is less of an individual, that one does not have as much strength or as much stamina if one reveals kindness and a tender heart unto others. The Word of God here makes no exceptions as to who is the one who is to be kind and tender-hearted, male and female, old and young, healthy and sick, rich and poor, all are called to be kind and tender-hearted. Being kind and tender-hearted does not mean that we cease to have our own unique and distinct personality, but being kind and tender-hearted means that we acknowledge that God has given unto the neighbor a unique and distinct personality. And because God has given unto the neighbor a personality that is different than my personality, that means we're not always going to see eye to eye. Being kind and tender-hearted means then that in occasions when there is not agreement with the neighbor on every point, that I do not dehumanize the neighbor. I do not view the neighbor as then an immediate threat into my life. I do not become angry at the neighbor because there is that point of conflict. But being kind and tender-hearted means that even in times of disagreement, I still view, treat, and interact with the neighbor as a human being. The neighbor is created by God. And if that neighbor is a member of God's church, then that means that neighbor is created in the image of God, in righteousness, knowledge of God, and holiness. And as a kind and tender-hearted individual, I treat the neighbor as such. The only way in which we can be kind and tender-hearted toward the neighbor is when we have tasted of the goodness of God toward us. The possibility of being tender-hearted is that we have been forgiven by God. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Lasting change in relationships will not come about simply by modifying outward behavior. Bitterness is a heart problem. And if we're going to address that bitterness, we must address the heart. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Behold, what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Christ came to His people upon this earth when we did not ask for Him. Christ took on our flesh and our blood in an act of deepest humiliation. What did we have in our hearts toward Christ by nature? Bitterness and wrath and anger. We dislike the authority of Jesus Christ in our lives. If we were with the Jews in Jerusalem at the time of the trial of Jesus Christ, we would have joined with those Jews in chanting, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! But behold, the love and the grace of God toward us revealed through Jesus Christ. He gave Himself unto that accursed death at Calvary in order that we might be given His righteousness and His holiness. He took our sins upon Himself and He paid that price so that even when we were yet enemies, 
We were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Beloved, it is only as we taste of the goodness and the grace of God toward us that then we are able to be kind and tender-hearted unto the neighbor. What has God done for us? He did not deal with us according to our sins or reward us according to our transgressions, but in His grace and in His kindness, He forgives us our sins. Let us then live a life that is close unto God, fellowshipping with Him in His Word and by the power of His Holy Spirit. That as we then partake of the goodness of God, we might in turn deal in love and in patience with the neighbor. This is the possibility of being kind and tender-hearted. And this is also the standard that God sets for us. Even as God says, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, so the calling is that you are to forgive the neighbor. Consider this high standard that God sets for us. What has God done? Number one, God was sinned against. The fact that God forgives us means that God was sinned against. Number two, what was true of God? God was impacted by these sins. He was hurt by the sins that were committed against Him. Genesis 6 tells us that He was grieved at the wickedness that was found upon the face of this earth. He was sinned against. He was hurt by these sins. But what did God do? Number three, He forgives the sins of the penitent child. He does not hold the sins of His elect children against them. And then number four, what has God done? He forgives even when it cost Him. It cost God His only begotten Son to forgive the sins of His rebellious, adopted sons and daughters. And now the word of the Lord is, even as God has forgiven us, so you forgive one another. Even as, number one, you've been sinned against. I am not minimizing the hurt that is caused by these sins that are committed against you. Number two, these sins impact you. They hurt. Even as God is grieved at His heart by the sins that are committed against Him, so the child of God is grieved by these sins. Number three, forgive. We do not hold the sins of the penitent individual over his or her head. We forgive. And number four, we forgive even when it costs us. If you were in a business relationship and the contract was broken, it could well cost you money to forgive the neighbor. It could cost you humility. But consider what it cost God. He paid not only with not with gold or with silver, but He paid with His only begotten Son to forgive us our sins. May God so strengthen us likewise to forgive one another. 
Amen. Let us pray. Father and our God in heaven, we come unto thee this morning confessing our struggles to be evil, to be kind and tender-hearted one toward another. Wilt thou grant unto us thy Holy Spirit that we might be humble, that we might be teachable, that we might be able to live in peacemaking relationships upon this earth. Wilt thou hear this prayer and preserve us throughout this day? For Jesus' sake we pray this. Amen. Let's sing now Psalter number 68. Psalter number 68. Grace and truth shall mark the way where the Lord his own will lead. Let's sing the four stanzas, Psalter number 68. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen.